Order! Order! You are an incorrigible delinquent at times. <laughs> Behave yourself, man! And you are listening to James O'Brien on LBC. I, I, I make no apology for returning to territory that we've already explored this week. Um, uh, indeed, the Brexit territory, arguably, we explore almost every day. Um, but the Debenham story has moved on, as you know. It crashed into administration yesterday. This puts thousands of jobs at risk, something that seems sometimes to be overlooked when the stories are covered from the perspective of, of the business pages or the business correspondents, because they write about share prices and investment and possible takeovers and debts. The, the horror here, as anybody knows, and I imagine that the massive majority of us have dealt with this either first or second hand. It, it, it might have been your mum or your dad or it might have been you. When you get your cards, you get your sandwiches wrapped in a road map, you get your notice, um, the axe falls. In this case, there's a period of profound uncertainty for Debenham's staff, about 4,000 of them. But if all 50 stores shut, then that will be sayonara to their jobs. And, you know, for all the talk the government makes of, of high employment, you get out, you've got a job that you like in a sector that is shrinking... You go out there and find another one, and, um, well, you'll be lucky, won't you? So, I want to get that out there front and centre. Uh, there, there is a, um, there's a tragedy. A very, there, there are 4,000 potential personal tragedies there, which I'm well, well aware of. And that, somewhere in, in, the, in the mists, is my own political position, oddly, which is really hard to pin down at the moment, given the mess that's going on and the absolute absence of a receptacle, a party-shaped receptacle into which I can reverse um, comfortably. But this story also involves so-called vulture capitalists. The downfall of Debenhams should be taught in business schools as a lesson in the dangers of greedy short-term private equity takeovers. And as I get older and, and find myself increasingly drawn to the subjects I know less about rather than doubling down on the ones that I think I know a lot about, a way to keep your brain active, I think, is to move into areas where your understanding is, is, is weaker. I, I don't know enough about this world. I, I think I've just been a bit pantomime about it and, and somewhat lazily typified these kind of organisations. Um, as all being as bad as each other, they're clearly not. I mean, you think of John Lewis, I suppose, which is suffering as well at the moment from the climate and, and, the, and the economic and political landscape. But John Lewis elected not to pass the business on to his sons. I, I think his sons did pretty well out of it. But he elected in his will, as I understand it, to share out the profits from his empire among the workers, or the partners, as they were called, and he elected to do it ad infinitum. Which is, when you think about it, an astonishing thing. There are also 19th century industrialists who took a more paternalistic view of the workforce, rather than seeing them as partners. Somebody like, um, is it Sir William Salt, saw them as children. Actually, I think that's probably the kindest way, who, who deserve to be loved and protected and looked after in return for their labour. So uh, he built a, a, a whole town for his staff. William Whiteley, the department store magnate, built a village into which his shop workers could retire comfortably. Uh, I know this because I went to a wedding there and, and absolutely fascinated by the history of the whole area. And I get a little bit, and this is why I'm not, a fully paid up member of the left or, 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 or socialism when it comes to uh, investment. I, I think capitalism is not just the best way, but, but probably the only way to keep a stable and secure society. But it, it's a balance. Most obviously between capital and labour, between money and people. And I look at this story, I hope I'm not boring you, I look at this story and, and I see evidence of my pet theory that the last 20 years or so, possibly a little less, possibly a little more, have seen the pendulum swing so completely towards capital that Labour has been 
almost abandoned. And that's Labour as in workers, not Labour as in the Labour Party. So listen to this. 13 years ago, Debenhams was bought by a band of... Oh, sorry, 13 years ago, it emerged from a very brief period under the control of a band of investors. The chief executive installed by this crew of private equity investors is believed to have made around £9 million from his own stake in Debenhams. The private equity firms that installed him made much, much more. In a sense, and this is the business editor of the Daily Mail writing now, Debenhams was a classic private equity deal in the sense of making as much profit as possible, as fast as possible. The question I'm going to ask you in a couple of minutes is going to be a variation upon the theme of, am I being horribly naive when I say dot, dot, dot? So... Three years it took them to make a return of approximately three times the £600 million that they put in. So they buy it for what they think is a song. They then embark upon a really punishing regime of cuts. Um, costs were slashed to the bone. Constant sales where goods were offloaded at rock-bottom prices. Investment in refurbishing stores was dramatically cut. Think about that. If you're looking to make as much money as you can as quickly as possible and you have no long-term loyalty to this brand or this business or the people who staff it, why the hell would you spend money on refurbishing a store? You wouldn't. That's money out of your pocket. That's why so many Debenhams now look, look dowdy and tired. Um, they sold off freeholds and put the stores on expensive leases, which makes it harder to close the stores, oddly enough, um, in terms of keeping the business lean. The idea behind private equity is not ugly. The idea is that, that many businesses have become flabby or inefficient. You hear this a lot in the public sector. So private equity come in and they're supposed to sort of trim off the flab and turn it into a leaner business, which means more of the money coming over the counter can make its way into the pockets of the investors because the business is now being better run. Vulture capitalism doesn't do that. Vulture capitalism identifies the quickest ways to make as much money as possible out of this thing that you've bought. And then when you float it, you, you, you make a killing. The reality, again to go back to the business editor of the Daily Mail, the reality in the case of Devmadams is that a once-loved business was hollowed out and left a shell with a debt that today stands at £720 million. Um, what's astonishing about that, of course, is that the people who bought it made an absolute killing, floated it, and it ended up with a debt of about a billion quid. So, what question am I asking you? I, I think this is a bit like, oh, crikey, we haven't used this analogy for ages, those magic eye things that we used to have around in the 80s. I used to use this almost every show to describe a sense I sometimes have of there being some truth that's just out of reach. There's some nugget of comprehension and, and, and understanding that is just just eluding me, but I can feel it. I can almost feel it on the tip of my tongue. And in the 80s, there were these pictures, like you probably remember them. If you stared at them for long enough, an apparently random series of squiggles, if you stared at them for long enough, you would eventually see a steam engine in the background or, or, or a, a hot air balloon or something like that. I never got the hang of them. I, it did something about my eyes and brain that no, I never, ever, ever, ever saw anything. All I ever saw was random squiggles. And that's how I feel today. I'm staring and staring and staring at it, but I can't quite nail it down. Because on the one hand, you've got people arguing that, that business needs to be respected and that nothing... And, you know, the, 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 the people that we've got a particular problem with at the moment who are always talking about small state and no regulations and let the market run everything. And on the other hand, you've got Jeremy Corbyn and, and his worldview, which is that the people who invest the money are somehow the enemy of the workers rather than the um, employers and or potential champions. And for me, the middle is where we should be. Obviously, as a patron saint of centrist dads, you'd expect me to say this, but, but the middle is where we need to be. You somehow need to put some limits upon what people like these so-called vulture capitalists can do, but equally, you can't have, I suppose, that 
carry on at your convenience model, if you remember that set in a toilet factory, a classic comedy from the 1970s, where trade union power had become so complete that they had the owners, the managers, the capital, the investors over a barrel. That is the history of economics. That is the history of humanity, actually. Uh, that, that simple relationship between the people who've got the money and the bodies that they need to do the work that must be done in order to ensure that they stay rich. How much of that money should make its way into the pockets of the bodies doing the work? If you take it to its, to its unnatural conclusion, you have slavery, where, where I buy you. And, I, and I, well, as long as I can keep you fed, as long as I can keep you alive, I get 10 hours a day out of you, all of which profits go to me. So slavery would be at one end of the extreme. At the other end of the extreme, I guess you'd have workforces so empowered that they were allowed to sit on their backsides all day doing nothing until the business actually folded and everybody lost, everybody suffered. So, looking at Debenhams, I suppose the simpler question is, how could it have gone differently? What, what do we learn? I learn that we probably need governments to limit what so-called private equity firms can do. Now, I hope there are some people listening to this programme who know more about this world than I do. Because what I'd really like to ask is, how can you tell the difference between a vulture capitalist and a decent one? 0345 973 is the number that you need. So, I mean, we're all investors in, in, in various ways, whether we realise it or not. But how can you tell the difference? Is, is, it, is it simplistic to suggest that Debenhams got completely filleted by people who were only in it for short-term profit? 0345 973 Is there anything that could be done by future governments to stop this from happening. The idea that the idea that society should protect the workers in some way seems to me to have fallen out of fashion in recent years, and it's part of Jeremy Corbyn's success that he seeks to bring it back into fashion. And then you have that kind of Tufton Street worldview, which is let, let the businesses do whatever they want, let the markets dictate everything, and, and you end up getting paid as little as these people can get away with. All of which is a very roundabout way of me saying, am I being horribly naive? Or could we be doing things in a way that wouldn't have seen Debenhams destroyed upon the altar of short-term profiteering? I think that's where we will be politically if Brexit ever blinking ends. We'll be looking at the relationship between labour and capital, as, as societies have done through the ages. I think you could argue that in Britain, the post-war settlement, from, from even from 45 to 2008, saw an unprecedented movement of power from capital to labour. I don't know, actually. I'm probably overthinking it. Let's get some other voices on the programme. Um, David's in Battersea. David, what would you like to say? Uh, hi, John. Just was taking a call. Um, Can you come off I'll speakerphone, suppose... mate? Would you mind? I shouldn't be on speakerphone. No? All right. Uh, well, it's, just, it's a bit echoey, so we'll have to keep uh, it short. I, Carry on. Yeah, I'll tell you what, I'm doing some tithing. That's there we why, go. probably why I'm in the bathroom. <laughs> <laughs> Is that better? That's better, actually. A lot better, yeah. Thank you. Right. Um, well, I think the root of all of this um, really does go back to the sort of Austrian economics um, gig that dates back to Thatcher and Reagan, when you basically had uh, the argument of free marketeering uh, with protection for the corporations from the general public and not the other way around. So you had, <laughs> sorry to get a little bit dry, but you had sort of Friedman, Norton Friedman and Hayek. Yes. Uh, both uh, arguing the opposite ends of the spectrum and uh, Friedman won. So instead of free marketeering, with some protections for the general public. That would be high end, would it? I mean, I'm a bit out of my comfort zone here. Yeah. Yeah. Yes. yeah, that's my that's my understanding of it. Anyway, uh, I don't pretend to be an absolute uh, you know geek on this thing. No, uh, but that, but that's why that, that's essentially it, and that, that's why really, you know, the FCA, the FSA, Trading Standards, National Measurement Office, they're all pretty useless now because. They, they can't stand up to these boys. They haven't got the power. So this, and again, I think we probably need to remind ourselves that neither of us are... Well, is there such a thing as a massive expert, actually? There might just be differences of opinion, but the deregulation in, 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 in the city in the 80s clearly yeah. played a part in some of the problems that followed because it, it, it sort of bought in, as this is what I understand the Austrian economic model to be, it bought into the idea that by pursuing profit, the markets will somehow self-regulate. 
Well, that's that's the biggest farce of all, isn't it? Really? I, well, I think it is. I'm just making sure I understand a what you're saying and b what we're both referencing. Well, it's the same as trickle. It, it's basically the same as trickle down. You know, the whole idea of trickle down. You know, these people will invest, and therefore it somehow makes it its way down to the people at the bottom of the chain. Which, you know, but people listening will say companies went bust in the 70s. Companies went bust before any of us had ever heard of of, of, of Hayek or Friedman or anyone. And and exactly. Exactly. I mean, it's a, I mean, you were very gracious to me a few uh, a few months back uh, talking about pubs. Yes. Um, and it's the same thing in my sector. I mean, we've got exactly this sort of thing happening in my sector where you've got. Well, it was venture capitalists as well, wasn't it? You, they bought a whole yeah, chains and then yeah. they they just so, try and milk as much as they humanly can out of them, and they don't ultimately care whether the pub goes under as long as that year they make a killing. Exactly. It's all about squeezing the bottom line by debt leveraging. So you can have a company with three billion worth of debt and only two billion worth of sales, but they, they, you know they can carry on because there's no one breathing down their neck. Um, I mean, a really good example. I won't mention the name because I've advertised on your station. Sure. Um, but, uh, but there was a hedge fund that bought a very well-known um, emergency service, you know, car car um, emergency roadside emergency services um, outfit. I think it was in 2008. It's and it's owned by an investment fund as well. I didn't know that. I didn't know yeah, that. So what do they do? They look around. I mean, but some of them must be good. I mean, this is where I don't want to turn in. Maybe I need to turn into Wolfie Smith and uh, <laughs> and, and, and re revivify the tooting people's well, front, but but some investors are good. I mean, you know, if I was trying to set up a business, I would need investors. Yeah, but how is it that, I mean, as you rightly say, for instance, in my example, the, the, this outfit was bought um, and within six months. They trimmed it down. They'd sacked 1,200 uh, members of staff, um, stripped it to the bone and flipped it for a £400 million profit. So what you're getting so that, is investors looking at a, at, a, at a business and saying, how can I make money out of that, rather than what I'm describing, which is... Um, sustainable. I, I could I could invest in this and make and I could make money. I'm not investing out of um, laziness or love, but it is not. A, I, I I want there to be something left when I've taken out my money, something profitable and well, productive just, and employing. Yeah, precisely sustainable. You know, who's the I best mean, person to read? Do you think for 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 a clearer grasp of of what you're describing? Well, crikey. Um, I mean, Robert Peston wrote a very good book about who really runs Britain. Yeah. Um, and, and the example I, I give is stated in that. Cool. And the company no, I, hasn't I like paid tax in the UK since. And he writes beautifully uh, as well. Mate, I'm going to crack on because I want to get some other voices on. That is the only reason. Also, you've got some tiling to do. I don't want to be your excuse. I want to be the dog that ate your homework. Uh, got a couple of phone lines free. I'm not surprised, frankly, because even I'm not sure what the question is this hour. Poor old Sam and Beth having to field calls without the presenter having a clue what the question he's actually asked the, 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 the people to ring in and answer is. It's something about capitalism. All right, 0345 606 0973. Give me a ring and say something about capitalism on 0345 606 0973. God, I'm good at this. Tony's in Wimbledon. Tony, what would you like to say? Yes, sir. Oh, good morning, James. Hello, Tim. I think we've just moved away from what we perceive as being traditional capitalism. I think once we liberalised the financial markets back in, I think it was the 80s or 90s, can't quite It was the then. 80s mostly. I think Eight. it carried, but it was a very, very Thatcherite thing, the, the deregulation yes. of, of, of the city, of the financial That's markets. It. And Reagan yes. very much on the same team. That's right. And I think what is done from there on, we've moved from like your tradition is a capitalist, somebody like a Lord Weinstock who built up GEC, who as a company, it had like its second biggest sort of profit center was its cash pile that it built up. And uh, potential investors were looking at that company thinking, right, well, let's not pay attention to what it does to make that money to have that cash pile. How can we get at that cash pile? And I think this is what's happened now. So companies like Debenhams, uh, they were put into play. Uh, the original owners over a period of time have reduced their shareholding and its shares were traded. And at some point, you can look at the company, you can suddenly see, right, it's got X amount of cash sitting there, it's got X amount of assets sitting there. I'm not concerned that it sells, uh, it needs to sell 100 pair of socks to make £5. Yeah, pounds. Yeah. I'm going to make gonna my profits by running a brilliant shop versus I'm going to make my profits by taking as much money as I can out of an already existing right. big business. Yeah. But, but I I, are we sounding point. naive? And, and, and uh, you know, people who think that they are supporters of Margaret Thatcher could be listening to this programme now and realise that they voted to destroy their own jobs and their own industries. I've got nothing but sympathy for them. But are we sounding a little bit naive? I mean, 
Can you put brakes upon these sort of things? What were the regulations that got removed in the 80s? Would they have made the blindest bit of difference to Debenhams? Just a few questions there, I, I Tony. I think <laughs> the regulations could help it along the way. I think now as you look at the high street suffering, you look at the simple fact that uh, manufacturing in this country um, is second place to the very sort of high speed trading and looking at these uh, companies and trying to get into them and turn them around and make money very quickly. We're in a limbo between those two types types of frameworks in many ways and as we sort of move towards some sort of Brexit scenario we need small and medium sized business and, and we need regulation before. as well of course to, to protect workers from, from what we could describe as vulture capitalism and, and look, I wasn't going to mention Brexit this hour but of course it's relevant <laughs> because what no no because what did they keep talking about the people who've now turned into an absolute cavalcade of, of, of cons and, and corrupt. Yeah, they they right. keep talking about deregulation and unregulated. We need to do this, yeah. we need to get rid of that. And you sort of think, well, get rid of what? I go, Crikey, the workers arguably are less protected in this country now than they have been for 50 years after the well, events of the 80s. And they, want, they think we've got too much regulation. Well, I think that's one of the things. I think regulation in many ways can be, it's, it's a two-edged sword, isn't it? You go back to the days of the mills and stuff like that and the very early days of the coal mines. It was yeah. just quite simply, if something came down and crushed a worker's arm, Unlucky. that was it. Might, 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 might be a few quid for the bar. widow to make sure the kids didn't starve, but otherwise, thank you and good night. Yep, that's right, and I think that's the that's the thing that we've got now. We've got to clearly sort of understand with automation as well. There are going to be for more challenges in the whole framework of commerce and the way business is done. And I think a lot of these people are businesses oh, about that, that operate in this predatory way. They're just, they're quite simply very clear set in what they're doing. There's an asset command, and they don't want to be famous. That. They don't want to be on the telly. They don't want to be held to account. They they just want to quietly trouser immense sums of money from a essentially running businesses, functioning businesses, relatively successful businesses, into the ground. I, I don't know, and, and um, I wonder if anyone does know how you put the brakes back on, uh, re-regulate. I don't know f f in any way whether or not things that happened in the 80s could be traced to the demise of Debenhams, but I do know that, that the chief executive installed by the private equity crew that... that um, uh, owned Debenhams briefly 15 or so years ago, made around 9 million quid personally. And today 4,000 people face losing their jobs. That's why I, I have this love-hate relationship with Jeremy Corbyn. I wish that the message that underlies a lot of his thinking was reaching more people. And I completely understand why the people it has reached like it. But you need a better messenger. You just do. 4,000 jobs gone. Nine million quid in the pocket of the chief exec 13 years ago. Yeah, come on. Why not two million quid in the pocket of the chief exec? Why not an increase of 50% on their original investment rather than 300% and then the money stays in the business? Not necessarily in a John Lewis way, but you spend it on research and development. You spend it on refurbishment and investment. You, you, you know and I know that, that a, a, a shop that is a pleasure to be in, populated by people that are pleased to be there, will be more successful than a shop that has been starved of investment so that the people who hold the purse strings can keep the money for themselves. Am I sounding naive? We're, we're doing, do you know? I, I sometimes sit here wondering what we talked about before the B word became uh, such a powerful force in British politics. We used to do the odd phone-in on the EU, and, and you can guess how they went. People would ring me up and, and say things like, um, I hate all those laws, and I'd say, which laws? And we'd part laughing, because they couldn't name any. And then for reasons that it will take historians uh, generations to unravel, that somehow became a political movement. The people who hated laws they couldn't name. And we are where we are. But I'll tell you what, it, austerity. We talked a lot about this since that... We'd gone too far in one direction. I used to talk about pendulums all the time. Uh, life is a swinging pendulum. Almost every issue involves a swinging pendulum. I'll tell you what, it, the intervening years have made that even clearer. Because stuff that we thought wasn't a pendulum anymore, stuff that we thought was fixed, has started swinging back in areas like tolerance and, and, and racism. Things that five years ago would have been unthinkable now arguably appear on national radio and newspapers. Um, but I digress. Because the relationship between money and workers, or capital and labour, to put it more traditionally, 
is enduringly interesting, and the collapse of Debenham seems to be proof that we've put far too much power in the hands of the money, and that always involves taking it away from the hands of the workers. Can you do that in a way that doesn't make you sound like Karl Marx or Wolfie Smith? Paul's in Filey, lovely part of the world. My uncle John had a cottage in Filey, Paul. I bet you didn't know that. Um, I think I've heard you mention it, James. Well, I mentioned it once or twice. You must come back. You <laughs> must come back. If we had to me. put five pence pieces in the meter to turn the it, heating on, I'll never forget oh, it. it. We've come on a little bit. <laughs> <laughs> Just a little bit. What would you like to say, Paul? Um, James, the concept of welfare capitalism... That was the vogue in the 50s and 60s when Britain made its post-World War II recovery. I mean, it was a Keynesian idea, and it was developed into a a word called Butskillism, with R.A. Butler from the Conservative side and Hugh Gateskill. And it was this cooperation between Labour, the unions, and... The, the factories and the, and the offices and the, the, the bosses, if you like, yes. on that term. Now, I remember the companies that I worked for, my father worked for, um, they were paternal, perhaps overnight paternal, but not too much because it was more the balance. But there was golf. If you wanted to play golf, you could go on the company golf course. There was netball. Uh, hang tennis. on a minute. I could keep the money that's been spent on the company golf course. Yeah, that's the, the, So we are, we're talking about the same thing, aren't we? Yeah, but it, it made the, com- the company invested in the community. And then the unions played their part. They even disciplined the workers. I, I'll admit it, my dad got in an altercation on the shop floor <laughs> and he got fined a, a half a week's wages, £10, really? pounds, a lot of money in those days, Gosh. by the union, not by the, uh, not by the company because there was this cooperation and... We can't go back in time, can we? Because things things have changed. But we need to have. Go on. Then what happened? 1970s, we all got greedy. The The Labour side got too complacent. This is a nice life, you know. A few few union barons. The the union uh, union barons, so on. They got too easy. Then Thatcher came in and, you know, turned the key the other way. Was that the and beginning then, of the tribalism? I think we went into uh, decline then because we lost our trust in each other as Labour and employers. We lost our trust. And I think the dreaded B word goes back to that. I really do. Good grief. I can see why. I can see why you think that. And that's why I just, as you spoke, saw the possibly the seeds of, of the tribalism that we discuss often on the programme and which the first caller today on the B word phone in did indeed cite as a reason for the, for the mess that we're in. This us and them thing. And the great triumph of, and I suppose Rupert Murdoch's done more to achieve this than anybody else, is that they've somehow persuaded a lot of the workers that they're on the same side as the bosses that are blind. That's the thing, you call it a working class Tory or whatever you want to call it, but that would be unfair on the, on the legacy of people like Rab Butler, wouldn't it? So... That's the mystery, isn't it? Is how so many people have been persuaded to vote for the interests of the likes of Rupert Murdoch and the Barclay brothers rather than themselves. Yeah, but they've lost the trust of the workers because in those days people believed in the company. It was industrial, admittedly. We're an industrially based economy then, but we believed in the product. We, There'd we be a loyalty as well, a, a, a sense of loyalty as well, and, yeah, and they'd be yeah. providing local clubs, as you say, golf yeah. courses. Do you know what I always... I did a double take when I read this. I think I read it in um, Mike Malloy's autobiography. Mike used to be editor of The Mirror. You know, a brilliant autobiography. And the, the, there's a dinghy you see it by the seaside, uh, called a mirror, a mirror dinghy. Yes, that's and, it. And, and it was actually a promotion from the Daily Mirror, so that, but, to use that phrase that's been horribly debased by Brexit liars, mm. ordinary working people 
could aspire to having a dinghy they could strap to the roof of the car and, and drive to the coast yeah. for a little bit of a spin around. And, and that is the polar opposite of what Red Top tabloids became under Murdoch. Yeah. Yeah. I always use that as an example of what it could have been like and what it used to be like in that period of post-war settlement that you describe. And then Rupert Murdoch came along and thought, I'm going to make money out of every... Uh, money or power at every turn. Nothing else matters. And that's turned us into what we are. Hmm. It's, it's still a concept, I think, in France and Germany today. Although um, they will have their economic idea. problems as well. And, and yeah. when, when people use that word globalism, they presumably... Whether they realise it or not, they are bringing in the fact that you can have a factory mm. in the middle of nowhere with no regulation, no workers' mm. protection. It's going yeah. to be knocking stuff out for a fraction of... Um... Yeah, even great paternal companies like uh, Renault are now in, um, going down that road a little bit. But... So, it's, uh, I, well, that's what makes me worry. That's what makes me confident we couldn't turn the clock back in that way because the, the employment scenario has changed. But uh, there's got to be a better way of doing things so that the 4,000 people at Debenhams would possibly still have a job and the people who took hundreds of millions of pounds out of the business a decade and a half ago would possibly not have quite as much money in the bank. That's all I'm saying. I don't know. I, I think Paul agrees. I didn't, how naive does that make me? 11.41 is the number you need if you want to tell me. Dan's in Leicester. Dan, what do you think? Good morning. Um, I, uh, when you said, um, phone up and tell me something about capitalism, I was straight on the phone because it was <laughs> reminded me of something, something that our mutual friend Jacob Rees Mogg said. Uh, Can we be a bit more respectful, please? Call him the J-Dog. The, the J-Dog, sorry. Um, he, he said, so I'll paraphrase because I wouldn't want to be guilty of a terminological inexactitude or anything like that. But right, right, he, he, he said, when, when it became clear that his funds were investing a lot in Russia and other emerging markets like that, he said that as an MP, he could never really condone that sort of behaviour, but as a businessman, he didn't have any choice because it's where the money is. Plenty of business people would disagree, and, and the J-Dog isn't here to defend himself from, from that um, apparent Intensible hypocrisy. Comment. Yes, but, but, um, but, but you, you, you carry on, I'm sure. Yeah, I just, I just thought it was a really neat distillation of somebody who's, who's capable of keeping two completely set, different sets of books like that. Whereas yeah, on the right. one hand, he can sit inside a really sort of moral and socio-political framework like Parliament. And then on the other hand, as, as the same person in the same body, brief against it so completely by uh, investing uh, and, in the... And that is yeah, the, to, to the detriment. But, but isn't that Patrick Minford in a nutshell when he talks about how a no-deal Brexit would be good without explaining who it would be good for, but acknowledging that it would involve the destruction of domestic industry and agriculture? Yeah, that, well, that's, that's the beauty of the words like the economy. It hides yeah. all manner of sins, right? Yeah, so of course the economy it does. Well, so does the not... word growth as well, of course, even more pertinently. Yeah, yeah, exactly. I mean, it doesn't necessarily matter where it comes from. We live in an age now where... Like people, people like the four thousand people at Debenhams who might lose their jobs don't stand to just become redundant, but become absolute obsolete as things because of the way retail is is moving. And you know there will be a distinct need for zero. They had this thing. I, I keep retail. plucking little nuggets from the dis dim and distant past, Dan, because I think they must have stuck in my mind for a reason, even if I didn't know why at the time. And I remember reading about Switzerland. And forgive me if I imagined this. But Switzerland subsidised agriculture so that the countryside continued to look nice. So the farms could have made more money by tearing up all the hedgerows and industrialising everything. And, but it, it, for me, that's what society does, or, or that's what politics should be for, is somehow recognising the not just the importance, but the utter essentialness of entrepreneurship and investment, but also recognising that unchecked, it would sell its own grandmother. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. I, I always feel exactly the same way when my knees are slammed up against the seat in front of an aeroplane. <laughs> like, why do we make life so uncomfortable for ourselves? <laughs> you can always, pay more, can always pay more and turn left. Um, but, but no, of course, for most of us, that's not an option. Coming up to quarter to 12, you're listening to James O'Brien on LBC, where we continue, I, I, clumsily, but I hope effectively from your point of view, just to try to work out the changing nature of the relationship between Labour and Capital and whether or not Debenhams should be a much, much louder alarm call than many of us currently realise. After 12 o'clock, we'll be uh, dipping into PMQs. I think we'll kick off live to see what happens. 
um, on the very simple grounds that if we don't, it'll be brilliant. And if we do, it'll be rubbish. It's just the way it works. I, I choose not to take PMQs live. It'll be absolute humdinger. I choose to take it live. It'll be rubbish. So I'm going to take it live, which means it'll be rubbish. But if I didn't take it live, it would be brilliant. What would you do? It's 11.49. You're listening to James O'Brien on LBC. In the next hour, at some point, we'll hopefully have the chance to examine the pressure that men now feel to look fantastic. Um, many, many, many moons have women endured that pressure and, and the toll it can take on, on people is, is considerable, bigger than perhaps many of us realise. Um, by many of us, I guess I mean scruff pots like me. I, I never really suffered from this. I saw myself yesterday as if doing a speech and I looked ridiculously messy. I mean, it was shocking, actually. I'm surprised nobody said anything. Oh, trousers halfway up my legs. I a shirt, kind of T-shirt and jumper. I, it's just appalling. My mum would be outraged. The only time in my entire life I've been smart is when I worked in suits and when I presented Newsnight. That was it. The rest of the time, oh, and, and, well, TV, you generally smarten yourself up for. But I've never had that, both inside and out. I, I, I decided a few years ago I needed to lose weight, but that was more out of respect for my wife and thinking, why should she have to wake up next to a big old lard ass like me every morning? She's far too... She deserves much better than that, so I lost some weight. But I, I, I'd have probably been an even bigger lard ass if, if I was single. I don't know. Anyway, I digress. We'll talk about that in the next hour. Before that, a little bit more on Labour and Capital. And I, I think there's a consensus emerging that we've allowed things to go too far. My friend I'm Incorrigible on Twitter, at I'm Incorrigible, has um, been tweeting an astonishing array of helpful aids to understanding this issue, including some graphs that, that really do track the transfer of money from company, and by that you can Im include workers, you can include investment in the future, um, the move from that towards filling the pockets as quickly as possible of the so-called private equity investors. And, and the reason we're talking about it is that Debenhams seems to have been done for from the moment that so-called vulture capitalists managed to get their hands on a on a then successful and thriving business. Paul's in Weymouth. Paul, what made you pick up the phone? Yeah, good morning, James. Hello. Uh, yeah, I've, I've um, gone through a couple of private equity uh, uh, takeovers and, and buyouts uh, from an employee point of view. Um, okay. The first one was sort of early in my, my career after leaving university. I was working for a for a group that was refinanced with a private equity house who were also refinancing another uh, company within our sector uh, and merged the two, uh, to which I was then made redundant very quickly, uh, uh, closing our, our head office. One of the key reasons being is obviously efficiency, which is sort of the buzzword of, of sometimes for getting rid of a load of staff and, and costs. Um, I was, was lucky. I was, you know, at an age where I was able to stay with the business and want to relocate and keep my job, but many of my colleagues colleagues weren't but the business then and i think this is sort of some of the inherent issues the private equity business then had a, a three to five year plan um where they obviously make profit when they then sell the business yes. um so that then that then happened uh the next private equity that come in that, that came on uh took on the business and then two businesses that had been bought for 100 million each were then sold for 450 million they were in it for, for three to five years, and then it was sold again for 650 million. That meant by this point, the, the, the equity company that, that bought it for 650, all of a sudden had a huge amount of debt that they then had to service, uh, which meant further efficiencies had to be caught. Uh, and so at some, at some point, the balloon burst, doesn't it? It has to. And that, that, so yeah. I'll tell you who you've just made me think of. You've just made me think of Deborah Meaden. I interviewed yeah. for my podcast, full, full disclosure, two or three episodes ago, and it, I, I love. It was in that sector. Ah, interesting. It's part. Interesting yeah. because when when I spoke to her and 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 I asked her how how because I, I, what I love about this podcast that I'm doing is that I get so much more time and space than you do normally when you're interviewing or talking to public figures, and we move quite gently towards the question of what it's like to sack people because one of the things I discovered about Deborah when I was preparing to interview her is that everybody likes her. Uh, she's incredibly well regarded in inside and outside business, showbiz, TV. And I said, and yet, on the other hand, when you've gone into businesses, when you've done stuff, you've had to fire people. You've had to um, 
sack them? How, how, how can you square the two? And she explained that she'd only ever get rid of someone if it was for the good of the business. So there is my very lazy definition of positive capitalism. Whereas yours, you're describing people losing their jobs, in, in your case, your job, so that the money that was being used to pay your wages could essentially make its way into the pockets of the people that had bought the company. Yeah. Yeah, and it, it, it's a challenging one, though, because equally, it's, you know, I, I work for, for a hotel group now. We, we have, um, you know, debt in the business, but we, we borrow from a bank rather than private equity. Yes. Uh, and I, I myself have had to, to, you know, close down a... Um, uh, uh, but uh, you've borrowed it from the bank, so, so, so you, need to, the bank so yeah, we, you need to service the was, debt. Yeah, but we, we are very careful with our, with our dealing ratio, we, you know, and, and the money that we've borrowed from the bank equally has been to take off, most, most recently, three stressed assets of the, of the hotels that were in administration yeah. um, that otherwise may well have closed anyway. But, but so you it, want those it, hotels you, to carry on thriving. You want to, and, yes. and the more they yes. thrive, the more money you make. If you were built differently, yes. if you were made differently, it's yes. like that film. Forgive me for being so trite, but is it is it the, the Michael J. Fox film when he goes off to be a secret, secret of my success? When he goes off to be a city player yeah. and a Wall Street yeah. player, and he comes back and he's essentially yeah. being charged with doing to his dad's the business where his dad works, which is an airline or an airport. He, he's essentially being charged with doing to that, and this is twenty or thirty years ago. That yeah. Reagan night venture capitalism, and he has a massive crisis of conscience, and instead realizes that he'd be a much better human being if he helped the aircraft business recover and thrive, rather than right. just flogging yeah. off all the raw materials, yeah. asset stripping, isn't it? That kind of thing. Yeah, 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 exactly. But that, I mean, that's there, there are certainly you know venture capitalists that are in it for the long term. And, you know, no, but that's the point. That I, know the really are, really I know there are, and I know some of them. I know so. I know people who are wonderful, and that, and they, they invest money in lots of businesses, but they want the business to thrive and survive. How many of the people that took millions out of Debenhams 13 years ago have woken up in the middle of the night feeling utterly, utterly crushed by guilt over the fact that 4,000 people could now lose their jobs? I'd have a hazard, I guess, at precisely none. Thank you, Paul. Joshua is in Manor Park. Joshua, what would you like to say? Hello, James. Hello, um, <clears throat> early on in the, in the, sh the programme, you were asking um, if there was a way, uh, an alternative way that we could do do um, mm. this capitalism thing and um, I'm coming from the other side of, of the fence where uh, obviously we... I'm going I'm I'm to very rudely insist that you do this in 60 seconds Joshua. <laughs> okay. Thank you. Let me go quickly to it then. <clears throat> I'm, I'm looking at a, a website that is showing me the, the most the 300 most successful cooperatives in the world. Yes. Okay. Give me the top three. The top three um, the top two are in France. Yes. Uh, Group Caisse de Epagne, which is in banking. Well, the top two are in banking, and they're in France. And the third one's in Japan, and that's in agriculture and forestry. And this is and where the workers have a stake in the business. That's right. And so, but not only do they have a stake in the business, but they get involved in all the decision making as well. So part of their. Do business you know Theresa May mentioned that? Oddly, remember when people she? thought that? She, yeah, she said putting workers on the boards of businesses and having better yeah. representation in the boardroom. That that that, yeah. that that was a plan. And then the usual suspects, not all of them, on Rupert Murdoch's payroll. Some of them just used to be on Rupert Murdoch's payroll, queued up or are hoping to be on Rupert Murdoch's payroll soon. Queued up to say this is ridiculous. Why would you put workers on the board? What do workers know? <laughs> <laughs> And, and I mentioned John Lewis, which I suppose is a cooperative in a sense, is it, I think? Indeed. A indeed. partnership. In, well, yeah, it's, it's a form. It's, it's not strictly a cooperative because obviously in John Lewis you don't get uh, any of the involvement in the decision-making, whereas a true cooperative, uh, everybody has a stake in the business, they share the profits, but they also... And that means you're going to work harder. Is this our old, I love this old adage that in order to make a poor person work harder, you must pay him less. And in order to make a rich person work harder, you must pay them more. Uh, I, I may have got Secret of My Success mixed up with Wall Street, apparently. They might have a similar plot. Who, who had, who's dad? Yeah, it was Martin Sheen, I can see, in the airport. And anyway, this is not the most important element of today's conversations. Joshua, I, thank you very much. Jason, I'm sorry, I, 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 I was hoping to squeeze you. Well, I, I can give you 30 seconds, Jason, if it's any use to you. Yeah.
I'm oh no, I know. I can give you a bit longer actually because we're not taking the news. So we're, to, okay. we're going live to PMQ. So I might cut you off in your prime, or no I might try and keep you talking until until Theresa May stands up. So we could be here for weeks. <laughs> okay. Carry on, Jason. <laughs> okay, I've been in retail for thirty-one years, yes. bricks and mortar, um, since a young lad. Now the problem isn't just capitalists, and I hate venture capitalists with a passion, but it's consumers. You know, everyone will wring their hands and say how sad that they've lost the jobs at Debenhams. And then they'll go online and they'll go to Amazon or wherever and get it somewhere cheaper and they think it's all right. Mm. They, they, they then complain about workers' rights, especially No, just in the let me pause you. I'm just going to oh, pause you okay. there because, sure. because you, you, you make a valid point. But the yeah. fact that the chief executive put in place by the venture capitalists walked away with a hundred with, with nine million pounds, and the people that the original investment tripled sure. in value over the period of ownership has nothing to do with people not going to Debenhams anymore. Absolutely right, and I, I as I said to you, I hate venture capitalists with a passion. Well, not all Even of them. Some a, of them are good, but the ones that oh. do this kind of thing seem pretty... The ones we would call vulture capitalists. But you're, you're, I'm yeah. not buying... I'm sorry, I'm not buying on this That's particular okay. question the, right. the, the, the perfectly valid observation that sometimes we don't know what we've got till it's gone and it's our fault it goes because we're too busy buying everything over the road or, or, or online. That doesn't work here. That's not what we're discussing today. If someone makes a success of a business, mm. like a venture capitalist... So, for example, look at the Glazier of Manchester United. Yes. Yeah, they loaded the club with debt, but they're still making loads and loads of money. Yes, the venture capitalists I've got a problem with are the ones who go in who put all their the shops on massive long leases and, and sell the freehold, take out the money. That's where I've got a real problem with. Yeah, that's right. It's but, exactly what happened at Debenhams, but that's got nothing to do with customers doing their business online. That's but, all. Sorry, I'm labouring that but, point now. That's okay, and I can understand what you're saying, but for me. If Debenhams, excuse me, had, um, oh, apologies, if Sorry, customers, no, no, first time caller, um, <laughs> um, with customers, yeah, they're saying that capitalism is a problem, that, and some capitalism is a problem, but they don't care because all they're thinking about is their own pocket. Yeah, how do they we don't... tell the difference? I mean, until it's too late. How do you... I, I mean, is it easy? I don't know enough about the city. Is it easy? Uh, presumably it's easy. You know which ones are in it for the short-term jackpots and which ones are in it for long-term sustained growth. You, you do because of who they put on the board. So if they put on the board a experienced retailer who has been successful in other retailers who will add value to the business, that's absolutely fine. If they put someone in the board, on the board and in charge as chief executive who has got a reputation, and a lot of these people who are going in with these venture capitalists now have got a um, reputation for just stripping down assets but, but everyone's, look, everyone's looking for, for easy money, mate, aren't they? That's the problem with our, our slightly idealistic world view, is that if someone said to you, give me 50 quid, I'll give you back 200 at the end of next week, you might not ask that many questions. You might not, but this is where shareholders, <coughs> excuse me, should be more active, especially smaller shareholders. I work for one of the biggest um, retailers on the high street. I worked for them for a long time. Yes. And you had people coming in who said I'm a shareholder. All they had was two shares. But they were treated like they were gods and they would go to the annual general meeting and ask questions about their individual stores and that's where we need to get to. Just back, back to re re recognising the, the, the relevance and importance of ordinary people. Uh, uh, whether, Absolutely. I, I, I agree with you on that. And oddly I, I'd hear ugly Ugly echoes of Brexit again, where they, they, they co-opt that kind of phraseology. They pretend that they care about ordinary people. And because no one else is giving the impression of caring about ordinary people, they get them to act and vote against their own interests. And there's no, absolutely no coincidence whatsoever that an awful lot of, 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 of the econo so-called economists and... Um, lobbyists that come out of that world of, of we need less regulation, we need less government, we need less of this, less of that, were also heavily involved in punting Brexit. Um, uh, there's a few disputes over my cinematic references here. Apparently, uh, Secret of My Success was 
relevant to asset stripping, but it was his uncle Howard who was doing it to a truck company rather than it being a, an aircraft company. And, of course, in Pretty Woman, uh, Richard Gere is, a, is an asset stripper, buys large companies that are on the verge of bankruptcy, breaks them up, sells them off in smaller parts. And it is Vivian Ward, famously played by Julia Roberts, who convinces him to build these businesses back up again rather than to strip them of their assets. That's the pretty woman school of economics via Secret of My Success and Wall Street. All a very similar era. And all, you see, you're giggling now, thinking that I've gone off on one. But I bet you that that was, I bet you that was cinema or storytellers accommodating Reaganite economics. Right there, all three of those films. I bet they came out quite close to each other. Wall Street, Secret of My Success, Pretty Woman. And they all will have addressed that simple business of making money the crop rather than spending money on seeds and growing a crop and then growing it again next year. Should we go over to PMQs before I turn into Barry Norman?